All right. Well, um, welcome, Carrie McCarthy, to Raw and Cook Vegan. Hello there. Thanks for having me. Okay. <laughs> so, so Carrie can be found at Carrie McCarpet, uh, the YouTube channel, and we'll, we'll I'll post that below, and we'll we'll talk more about that. But first, if you would, Carrie, can you can you tell the viewers a little bit about how you were raised and how your family looked at diet and nutrition, if they did at all, and and fitness as well. Yeah, well, my parents are South African, so their whole social life kind of revolved around barbecues or braai places, <laughs> all over there. And uh, so they eat meat twice a day. They still do. Yeah. But on, on the plus side, being in South Africa, it kind of means there's a lot of fruit and vegetables around and it's an outdoorsy kind of place. So yeah. um, my dad and sister and me were very lucky that my mom was so fastidious about including vegetables with everything we ate. So I grew up eating meat but having quite a good diet. And she always had fruit in the house, but it usually got thrown away, <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> so we tended to eat uh, junk food, but it's a generally okay kind of diet. So I give them a 9 out of 10 for trying. <laughs> All right, that's cool. And it sounds like you probably got outside a lot. You got plenty of sunshine, that sort of thing. Well, a little bit, but actually uh, we moved to Scotland when I was four. So that's a whole nother deal. That's like nobody goes outside. And their diet is also very meat heavy, but uh, based around fried stuff a lot. And I have tried a deep fried Mars bar in Scotland that's what they're famous <laughs> for and it's horrible it tastes like fish <laughs> oh, gross but then, I've, I've heard of the fried Snickers yeah that's pretty disgusting oh god yes oh they do Maltese they do tiny little things as well they, they go mad with it but there's gross. in the um in around the 90s my mom actually stopped feeding us any beef at all because we had a scare in Britain um with this mad cow disease epidemic yeah. They, yeah. they thought we were all going to be mad in about 10 years because that's the incubation period. And my mom and sister were convinced they had it. You know, it kept fixating on all the times they'd had really cheap hamburgers and stuff. So uh, we stopped eating red meat, although the parents still eat that. And that was interesting because that was the first time I saw, um, you know, widespread panic about meat and also remorse about the way animals have been treated because the reason the cows had got this Creutzfeldt Jakobs disease was because they'd been eating uh, sheep and in turn the sheep had been fed the droppings of chickens as you know all systematized and seeing this on the news and with that being discussed for the first time really people were suddenly questioning our methods i mean it really is a daisy chain of abuse because the cow and the sheep are herbivores and they're both being fed the wrong thing so uh that that was when i first started thinking you know this really is awful before i'd always felt guilty about eating meat but it seemed like that's just nature and it's just a cruel thing you know you but know, then I really thought that's not that's not good at all <laughs> I had, I guess I had developed, um, well, you can tell me how much this is true. I mean, I've always thought that the Europeans are a little more careful with their food, but, but what you're saying sounds like commercial uh, beef production in England is not much different than the United States, if they're... No. If, yeah. No, really, not at all, because recently there's been a scare about beef actually being horse meat that's very cheap from, I don't know why horses are cheaper than cows, but <laughs> they were putting... Yeah. Um, horse into uh, beef burgers without anyone knowing and there was a massive uproar about it and actually as a vegan because this was recently I just thought what's the difference you know and lots of people who are vegetarian thought the same thing like why are you so upset when it's one animal but not when it's another and I would see this in Scotland they're very Scottish people are kind of like blunt forward you know they and yeah. they to try and um, they wouldn't try and hide or sanitize the meat production the way you see in other places and they would literally in the town I grew up in there was a butcher with pigs just hanging in the window like a sort of decoration and it was really <laughs> quite sick and I don't think they'd do it now because parents would complain why you you know my children are seeing this but uh, I, I also thought you know that's just totally abhorrent that just really jars that's not right at all and god yeah. bless morrissey do you know morrissey over in america the composer I, and singer i i've heard the name i don't know much about him <laughs> well he's this really sullen character and he manages to maintain a complete militant morosity in the face of totally uh 
that's not the right word, morosity. <laughs> no, no, anyway, he, he's constantly <laughs> down in the face of uh, complete, you know, wealth, success and an onslaught of caresses from the public. So he always complains no matter how good his own life is. And it's never about the plight of middle-class, white, middle-aged men like he is. It's always about voiceless groups. And he had a song, I think, in the 90s called Meter's Murder, and it really paints the um, act of eating meat in a dreadful, vile context. And mm. I remember listening to that and thinking, you know, it's, it's good that what I feel about eating meat isn't wrong. Adults also feel the same way. And I did also, I had a friend who was a vegetarian, the only, seemingly the only vegetarian in Scotland. And her two parents were both doctors. And so that also made me see that it's possible. And I made up my mind quite early on that as soon as I get out of home, as soon as I leave home, I'm going vegetarian because I couldn't do it while I was at home because my parents are like, that's ridiculous, you know. <laughs> well, there, boy, there's, there's several questions I want to ask you here. It sounds like you studied this a little bit, this, uh, the mad, what we call the mad cow disease. You, you used another name. What was that name? Kreutzfeldt Jakob's disease. I um, don't know where that comes from, but. Well, and, and something occurred to me the other day on this. Uh, you know, we have these uh, nervous disorders like MS and um, par par Parkinson's, and, uh, and, and I've been reading a little bit about that, and it seems that it could have something to do with uh, uh, proteins, unhealthy proteins in the system that, that damage aspects of the nervous system. I wonder if that's a similar phenomenon in the cows. Yeah, it's uh, as a result of prions in the cows, which are proteins that are folded weirdly, uh, causing human proteins to fold in a similar way. That's apparently what prions do is cause, uh, you know, conference in other proteins. And I've just done a video on that about the brain and how it seems that our problem with the cows was that our biology was similar enough to be affected by their prions that were doing this. And I think it's, it seems like it's the same with dementia, that, you know, in countries where they don't eat as much meat, there is a really, it looks like a very direct correlation between their rates of dementia and how much meat they eat. So I wouldn't be surprised if the other things that, you know, even things like arthritis, which seems like an autoimmune uh, disease where your yeah. body's attacking itself, I wouldn't be surprised if it's because you've got similar biology to your own coming into your body and your system thinks I've got to attack this invading thing and it goes mad and starts attacking your own, uh, you know, tissues and stuff too. Exactly. Although I, I don't know, but it, it just seems like um, rates of meat eating and rates of these illnesses do uh, are proportionate. So yeah, it's interesting. Exactly. I wish they'd do some studies on it, but there's not much money in you know, uh, veganism. So <laughs> they never get funded, really. I don't right. Know. It's, it's really interesting. I, you, you're probably familiar with Dr. McDougal, and he references yeah. this Dr. Swank. And I saw in, I think he did a lecture in 2000, 2004, maybe. And he talks about this, that this autoimmune feature, and it starts attacking your own body because the proteins are so similar. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so, so your mother kind of withdrew meat out of fear when you were in your teens. Well, she just withdrew beef. We still ate all the rest. And she tried to, yes, it was when I was about, I can't remember, in the 90s. So, yeah, I've read about teens just before. And um, she she tried to get us to eat the um, analogs, whatever, you know, corn and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Couldn't stand it. And <laughs> <laughs> so I was the only one who didn't care. So I think I've got a natural disposition. Like, I like, if it was up to me, I would have eaten cereal all day. So... Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't care at all, but the rest of the family complained a lot, and so he went back to eating steak and stuff. But that was an excuse for me not to ever have to eat red meat at all, really. So chicken and fish, they still ate all the time. Okay. And, yeah. <laughs> so you did, okay, and so, but you had, it sounds like you made this decision that when I get out of the house, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go vegetarian or vegan or... Well, I didn't, I was an idiot because I thought I'll just go vegetarian because I can envisage milking a cow myself. I don't have a problem with that. And I yeah. can imagine taking eggs. But I was naive because, you know, if you even give it a cursory <laughs> second thought, you realize that milk is obviously part of the same industry and, and it leads to the veal industry and stuff. But I was just vegetarian for a while because that was the thing that pained me the most. And it's not. You know, people say vegans are awful because they've got the moral high ground and they give you a hard time, like ex-smokers. 
but it's not really an altruistic thing, I don't think. It's, it's because you feel so bloody awful eating meat that for, for, some, for people who go that way because of ethics, I just couldn't live with the guilt. So it was a selfish thing that I just did, thought, uh, I'm not going to be part of this. Yeah. But you don't feel like you're brilliant. You just feel some relief that you're not part of this disgusting <laughs> thing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's, that's interesting. So your primary motivation was ethics. And would you say health, health was secondary or not even a factor? Yeah, it, it, well, it wasn't even a consideration. But I, unbeknownst to me, um, I could have used, you know, some... I could have looked at my diet when I was growing up and had improved health like I always got whatever was going around I would always get colds and I had acne pretty badly from the age of about 13 and I think in girls it, it tends to be more chronic like it just stays with you till you're in your 40s you know and <laughs> yeah. I've got that I've, although it's it's gone uh since going raw vegan in particular and going vegetarian didn't make much of a difference but you know I didn't know diet affected anything at all so I really didn't know that uh, changing my diet would fix that but also up in Scotland, you know, you don't get much sun and the hours of the day are quite short. And, uh, you know, if I'd have known about vitamin D and stuff like that, then I think I wouldn't have been as melancholic and depressed as a teenager. There are lots of things I could have improved on, but I didn't know about. That's interesting. Um, my vegetarian didn't particularly help because I wasn't eating a good diet. I just left home and I was pretty much eating cereal all day. <laughs> so it was sort of <laughs> later on that I um, had a much, you know, much more of an improvement in my health once I started actually looking at the health aspect of things and going vegan. Okay. So how long would you say you were actually vegetarian? Um, I think, let me see, from about the age of 15 to probably 20-ish. And uh, round about at the age of 20, I had a massive sort of uh, scare to me. I'm sure this is quite quotidian, but um, I was getting palpitations really badly. And they would last for like five minutes. And I'd get that every day after a while. And uh, then, you know, because I'd ask people and they'd say, yeah, we get that as well. Don't worry about it. It's very common, seemingly. I can't believe it. And then I, it, I just left it. So it got to the stage where every few minutes I was getting the feeling of a skipped heartbeat, like, you know, just like that all the time. And uh, I didn't have a doctor, but I went to a drop-in center and they said, oh, it's probably um, stress, which I knew okay. it wasn't. Okay, and Carrie, before you continue, let me clarify. You kind of said this, but so basically your diet, it was vegetarian. You were eating a lot of cereal and milk and anything else? Um. Yeah, well, not just that, <laughs> but that would be the kind of thing. I would eat lots of carbohydrate foods, but also lots of fat as well, like, you know, confectionery, toast, pasta, uh, beans sometimes, but a lot of processed stuff. I don't think I was massively into fruit and vegetables, and occasionally I would have a health kick, but I didn't really believe they affected your life that much, you know. It, yeah. The only thing I cared about from a young age was being thin, so I was, I was always like, uh, afraid of like counting my calories and keeping them quite artificially low and probably being quite you know depressed and depleted in other ways as a result but I didn't yeah. care about health <laughs> it's like, until I had this you know palpitation thing okay uh, and and would you say um you said you're about well first of all if, if you became vegetarian when you were 15 did you did you leave home when you were 15 round about then yeah, yeah. wow okay <laughs> wow all right and then, um, so then you're about five years vegetarian, and you said this, this heart palpitation is progressively getting worse. And were you approaching like five years when it was becoming almost continuous? Yeah, yeah, I think it was about 20. And uh, I went to the doctor who said it was probably stress without any blood tests or anything. In the end, it was an iron deficiency. And uh, I think if I'd have Googled that better, I would have come to it quicker, but I had no idea what it was, and I thought it was probably an allergy to uh, caffeine or chocolate or something. So I thought it was a trigger. I didn't realize it was a deficiency. So that's when I discovered the raw vegan diet, because I thought I'll take everything out my diet altogether that could be a trigger, and I instinctively knew fruit and vegetables are the things we've been eating all along, so they won't be the trigger. Yeah. And I just ate raw vegan for a couple of days, 
and I, my plan was to introduce everything back in and find out what it was. But I felt so amazing after a couple of days that I started researching that instead. Like, what the hell does anyone else know about this raw food thing, you know? And of course, there were loads of people doing it already. Uh, David Wolf was the first person I came to, and Shazzy, who's a woman in England. Who I've seen they, her. She's, she's a real character, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and they, they both pretty much advocate quite a high-fat diet, and I think they're both weary of sugar. Um, and Shazzy still is. I mean, she seems like a really nice woman. Uh, so I, d I hate bad mouthing people, but I don't believe that that's the best way. I think the 80 10 10 thing is a better approach in terms of how they make you feel. But still, yeah. because my problem had been that I really wasn't eating anything that healthy at all. So I was really deficient in lots of different things. And just any improvement was going to both. It fixed the palpitations. I did actually realize it was probably iron, and I started drinking green smoothies because I thought that that would be better than iron pills. People had told me iron supplements don't work that well. So I thought, you know, the good thing about actually eating food with iron is you get all the coefficients that help you absorb the iron too, which I believe pills don't always quite work as well. Right. But, um, on that issue, uh, did you find in your studies that there's a a relationship between iron and B12? Oh, no, I haven't looked at that. Okay. I haven't just just curious. You... Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Although, they do, if you're low on B12, you get some kind of anemia, don't you? I think. Right, right. And, and right. with iron, you get anemia. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if, uh, yes, I wonder if sometimes possibly uh, the symptoms of uh, iron deficiency might be similar to symptoms of B12 deficiency. But anyway. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it was that because I really wasn't eating anything at all. Mind you, I was eating cereal and that's fortified with B12 in Britain. I don't know if it is abroad. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I don't know. And I was still drinking milk at the time. But uh, I don't know what, I think I just wasn't eating very good food at all for a while. <laughs> okay. So, so you did this three days, it was, initially it was going to be three days, and then you felt so great, you just kept doing it? Well, I just, I didn't know, I didn't really have a plan, but I was really at my wit's end and decided to just see how it goes, take everything out and see if they would go away, the, the palpitations. But I felt so amazing in every other way, like I was leaping out of bed at six in the morning and uh, lots of different things, like I just had so much energy and I felt happy and I realized, you, you know, you've never given any thought to the health of your diet. It's really time to start looking at it and whatever you're doing here must work and it's probably going to help the you know the palpitations right. so uh, I just carried it on and then thought I want to feel like this all the time so I started following the advice of Shazzy and David Wolf and uh, the reason I now think it's a good idea to go on YouTube and talk about this kind of thing is because I kind of wish I hadn't <laughs> done the high uh, fat thing for so long and also they both advocate uh, raw chocolate and stuff raw cacao yeah and it all seems to come under the aegis of uh, detox symptoms if you have any weird side effects from eating raw cacao or, you know, when you eat a high fat raw vegan diet, I certainly found my digestion wasn't good and my skin would break out worse than before and um, it, I just didn't feel energetic. And because you're expecting this detox period, you keep telling yourself that's probably what it is. I'm just going through detox. And with yeah. cacao, I just felt insane. I just felt like I'd drunk loads of coffee, you know. But yeah. again, the headaches is probably detox. So I, you know, uh, that's a that's a great point, Carrie. Uh, I, I think people sometimes don't realize that it's like when someone gets as clean as yourself, and then you eat a piece of chocolate, you can really tell if you're eating I, if you're eating chocolate every day. You think it's kind of normal, but you don't realize that it's, it's really the body does not like it yet. I know. You know, there was an article recently where this woman um, said that a naturopath had told her she'd had eight squares of chocolate and really paid for it and felt really ill. And the woman didn't believe that at all and said, oh, please grow up. You know, but they, you don't realize it actually does because I had some chocolate. Uh, a couple of years ago, <laughs> and I used to be completely addicted to it and have no side effects at all. And it didn't make me feel bad. It just made me feel really buzzed and, you know, wired. And yeah, that's yeah, yeah. just ordinary dark chocolate, you know, vegan, but not raw. So the raw stuff has a really bad effect on me because it's even more potent and actually will give me a headache. And 
for about a year, I was eating it and not realizing that just because it's raw doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, I wish I hadn't had that because it is so confusing. And I think now I think detox is more like you've, I don't know, it seems to vary for different people. And it, it was totally bewildering some of the things your body does when it's fixing itself. But I think the way it would often go for people would be like you get the flu, you appear to get the flu for a few days. Yeah. It seems to go that you feel amazing for a week or maybe two weeks and nothing happens. And then you go through detox where you seem to get the flu or something like that. And I don't know how long that lasts in the average person, but I would imagine no more than a, a few weeks or a month or, you know, a few days, hopefully, if you're reasonably healthy. And then um, I noticed all kinds of weird stuff like... I had broken both elbows at different times, and the body seemed to go back and fix them again. I love, I love that you're saying this. That's fascinating. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, uh, so I'd broken them at different times, and in turn, it seemed to go back and fix old injuries chronologically backwards. So it started with the most recent stuff. And I didn't know that. So I was like, oh, this is sore. That, you know, why is this hurting again? Am I doing something wrong? And then the next day it would be fine. And so I don't know what that was about. And then the other one. And then when I realized this was when it was revisiting the external, you know, like scars. And um, I had scars on my face. I look very erubescent. I look very red today because it's really hot. <laughs> no, you look fine. You look fine. <laughs> Anyway, I, I noticed it was revisiting uh, the, the skin, which you can actually tell what it's doing. Like uh, the scars would suddenly look all pink and, um, you know, a bit, you know, like something was happening. Like inflamed, and, inflamed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then and then after not never risen. So I was I was wondering if, if something good was going on, but I'd had acne scars for about. 15 years or so and so I was pretty sure they weren't going to go away it's some pigmentation you know like red marks as opposed to the deep things yeah and yeah. this seemed to make them go away and it and I, I, I attributed it to certain fruits more than others seemed to be doing more work like the, the water rich fruits like papaya melon that kind of thing would also puff out the skin and even puff out your wrinkles and stuff it's just amazing so they were really good uh, detox things. And then, of course, you get an emotional detox as well, where you feel a bit like for the first time you're aware of your emotions because you don't realize how inebriating cooked and processed food is. Uh -huh. Have you had this? Like, you only realize when you've been eating a clean diet for a while and then you have some processed soup or something, which seems innocuous, and you feel quite pleasantly drunk. But you didn't realize that you're doing that to yourself every day. So... I think in the absence of that, you start um, feeling some emotions, but I think it's m maybe more profound than that, that possibly your, uh, an, your body, your physiology is connected to your emotions in ways you don't realize. Like maybe some of the fat holds memories or something or, or puts you back into a state that's similar to one that's bringing back these emotions or something. But you know, there seems to be something. <laughs> fascinating, Carrie. That's fascinating. And, I, I, you know... I think uh, Dr. Graham and some other raw fooders refer to grains as having, I don't know, are they opiate, like, like opiate oh. qualities? Or, <laughs> so uh, that, that's very interesting. And, and like you're saying, just like a drug addiction, if you come off it, then emotions will come up and you'll kind of have to process some psychological issues most likely. Yeah, yeah. And I found another thing that I've heard other people have is my dreams were very vivid and they started making complete sense. Like... You know, I, I had a dream where I went back to my childhood home and new people were moving in. And I was like, what are you doing? Can't you even wait until I'm gone? And, you know, like just taking my duvet off them and saying, why are you moving in? Why can't you wait till I'm gone? And immediately they were like, oh, gosh, sorry, if you want to live here, that's fine. No, we didn't realize if you want to live here, don't worry. And I thought, um, I don't want to live here. I've moved on. What am I doing? And uh, the dream made so much sense to me. Like, you know, actually let go of the past because you think you are nostalgic, but you're not. You've moved on. And I would constantly have dreams like that. And normally they're just a jumble of, <laughs> you know. You know, this is, a, this is a huge point because um, this process can be so different for each individual. Yeah. And it, it sounds like it happened pretty rapidly for you. Uh, and, and since we're here, maybe you can talk a little bit about this because to me, it's, it's important to emphasize veganism 
I, I, I recognize from what I've read and learned from others, I think, I think the raw food diet is, is the, the healthiest. But for a variety of reasons, I think um, the, the uh, vegan diet or cooked vegan diet is much more accessible for yeah. a, a large portion of society, especially in terms of transitioning from an animal-based diet. So yeah. what can you say about that? I mean, you know personally this raw food thing is the bomb. It, it's the healthiest way for you. What, what can you say about this, about communicating to folks that are still eating meats and using, using cooked veganism as a transition? Or even like, you know, McDougal kind of considers it the healthiest way to go. How do you, what would you say about that? Well, I have had lots of struggles with the raw food diet because it's so difficult. And even somebody who wasn't eating a heavy diet before, because I was just eating like processed, you know, rubbish, like toast and cereal, really. Um, yeah. Although cereal's not terrible, but like... Depending uh, on the kind, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Even I was having a problem sticking to the raw vegan diet. And so now I do eat cooked food. And it's like when I was on the raw vegan diet, luckily I found a friend at work who uh, is a Rastafarian. And so he has lots of other things tied in with diet as well, like, you know, religious ideals and things, which I hadn't. And because we had each other, we would discuss how we were finding this raw vegan thing all along and, and over about, I don't know how many years, like low 10 years at least, we've been talking about it and both of us have struggled tremendously with it. And whenever he crashes, he finds he even goes back to eating meat, which I mean, at least I didn't have that problem, but I wouldn't go to eating something like rice or potatoes before I would just eat processed food for a while. And I don't, I really don't think that's healthy in terms of uh, you know, sometimes I even look at people like Steve Jobs, who started off as a fruitarian and then said later on in life, oh, I just treat my body like a dumpster, like everyone else now. So I just eat anything now. And it's made me wonder from my experience if actually if you get really clean and then you totally bomb and, <laughs> and just eat processed rubbish, it may do more damage than if you've been training to eat processed stuff and your body's built up a resistance. You know, this is a, there's a lot, so much information here, so many different topics. Um, could you clarify a little bit about what was it about the raw diet that was difficult? What, what was challenging? <laughs> really, for me, it's the evening meal thing, the savory stuff, because fruit seems perfect and it seems something that we're just designed to eat. But you get into the habit of eating um, casseroles and stews. And if you're a uh, vegetarian or vegan, it's the same. It's, it's like rice and pasta dishes. And it was trying to find something that would uh, be similar. And actually, it's only in recent years that I've found things that I find satisfying. Like, I find salads that are huge and cut up really small so that with the greens cut up really small so that the greens become like rice or pasta. Huh. And certain sauces like made out of tahini, which actually you've got to test because some people, it doesn't agree with them. It makes some people break out and stuff. But, you know, certain things that have now only recently turned up and I realized that can really help. I could probably sustain it more now. But before, because I had no backup plan, like, you know, Jury and Ryder and Freely always say, yeah. uh, I felt like if you haven't, if you eat some rice or something, well, you may as well just eat loads of processed stuff because this doesn't work. But then because it makes you feel so amazing, you just keep coming back to the raw diet. In fact, even now, I've been trying the raw till four thing for about seven months and it's just so easy. I, I don't find any effort at all and I notice in shops and stuff when I see foods I used to eat they have no effect on me whatsoever. There's no nostalgia. I just don't want them. And with the raw vegan thing you sometimes don't feel uh, satisfied in quite the same way no matter how much fruit you've had. But having said all that I think that um, after doing the raw till four diet where you eat raw food in the day and then have a cooked thing in the evening and it's often whole foods, you know, potatoes, rice, that kind of thing. Um, now I'm getting back into thinking I'd like to do more raw stuff than this. I'd like to maybe go back to 100% raw and see how that goes. And I think, therefore, this raw till four thing is a great thing to start with because you get used to eating whole foods for a start. And maybe it's a case of your system needs to clean itself completely before you can do 100% uh, raw easily. So it may be a case of 
having to gradually move over to a, a better diet. But I, I think the raw till four is brilliant because it takes away the stigma of uh, eating cooked food, which we know is slightly less than, well, it's, it's less than perfect. Yeah. But at the same time, I, I totally agree with you. It's, I mean, what have you found? Do you, what's, what do you do? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I've never gone for a really long time fully raw. So I, I but, yeah. but, but everything I've, from the people I've interviewed about it, it's like I know, I know in my gut, I feel like it's the healthiest way. Uh, but I can't say that from experience. And, um, and I do, I do uh, feel, at least for myself, and I think a lot of other people, like, like you said, you just kind of alluded to it earlier, that there's some kind of satisfaction that comes from these, I don't know if they're more solid foods or what it is. Now, maybe that coincides with the drug effect you were talking about earlier, you know, I but um, <laughs> I mean, from what I've, I mean, part of it too is like the logistics for me, getting over this logistic hurdle of having... 10 mangoes for a meal and having that much produce in the house. That, yeah. that seems a, a bit challenging. Um, and then like somebody like yourself, you're in London now, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, what about in the winter? It's like, you, you can't eat locally. Do you, do you buy cases of bananas? You know, maybe yeah. we can talk about that a little. A yes. Yeah. There's, there's, um, I, I'm in Wood Green in North London, so it's full of supermarkets, and bananas are about 10p each. So even if I don't buy bulk, it's it's great. Um, but there is a there are a couple of uh, which are wholesalers, um, which I have to get the underground, and it's a bit. If you're gonna be really, if you're gonna make a, a plan and everything, I would buy a proper kind of wheelbarrow thing and go and then go on the underground and get one that goes up steps and all this. And I've never actually done it, but I have gone to these wholesalers sporadically with a friend because they're quite intimidating because there's like full of these men in truck things going around and practically <laughs> <running you> over. <laughs> so because I don't have a car, it makes it quite difficult. But ideally, see, I think the raw till four thing and this desire to go 100% vegan again from a better place, you know, not from a place of desperation, like, oh, I've been really unhealthy. I really need a quick fix. I love what you, that's very important. It's not a, it's not a self uh, castigating thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that has made me think more about actually the reason you haven't gone to these wholesalers, you're just making excuses because you weren't in a right in the right place to make this your life at the time. But raw till four means that you get so much practice eating fruit all day that you do start thinking um, you, all the effort in your diet seems to be taken away. You're not focusing on the anguish of never being able to eat cooked food. So you just get into the habit of doing it. And I've been thinking I will go to the wholesalers more often because you can get mangoes so cheaply. And it's mangoes in Britain that are expensive. They're like £1.50 each, which is a couple of dollars each, I think. And You know, uh, you know it's so funny what you're talking about. You're reminding me of uh, Dr. Ruth Heydrich. Um, and she, one of the main reasons she likes the raw diet so much is that there's so little work involved. Yeah, me too. You know, yeah. She doesn't want to be in the kitchen, and it's just easier. You know? Oh, totally. And I think sometimes because people like us maybe bang on about <laughs> diet all the time, people may think we have an interest in food, but we're probably, well, for me, I just want it to be something automatic that I don't have to think about so much because your average person is bombarded with this gastronomic excess every time they go to the supermarket. And not only is it an effort to work out what you're going to eat, but then it, none of it is that complete. It's not healthy for you. And I've got a friend who calls lunch time, he, he describes it as the crushing inevitability of lunch. He gets really overwhelmed by choice and he gets properly depressed. I've never quite understood it, but. Oh, that's, 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 that's a great point. You know, yeah, if I, if I eat a huge banana smoothie, people are like, how can you eat so many bananas? You know, they just don't get it. And it's like, well, yeah. any animal in nature pretty much eats a few items, you know, yeah, it's not like I, they have all this variety. It's, it's great to put it. And then you feel that you're much freer to give yourself to other things. And you don't realize how much time you've wasted on the mundane priorities of survival before. And then it becomes so easy. And I do think once you get into the habit of going to wholesalers and you have cases of stuff lying around, it makes the diet much easier. I think that abundance in your home is a great help. And it seems yeah. like 
everyone you look at on YouTube has a pile of bananas in the back. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so there's so, um, so you so you you how many years would you say you did the high fat uh, raw? Oh, about, about five years, and then um, I was talking to my friend. Chris, who was on the same thing, and we were finding two things that it was unsustainable and that we were still going to do it for life because it was the best thing. And uh, we both, because I had a friend to discuss the raw cacao thing with, we both decided it's not that great. It seems like a drug to us. Yeah. And um, then I went on a raw till four diet on my own. I just thought, uh, I'm just going to do this for a while. And I had only I only thought about this recently that for a couple of years I was doing that and feeling like a failure, but that was a time when I got some great health really and I you know I I was feeling great you know walking seven miles to work and back and that's you know that's, this is this is a huge point feeling like a failure and yet <laughs> you were doing that so so this, yeah. the power of the mind and and the groups that we're in and the, the I, I love the point you're making there that's great for <laughs> especially new folks you know who are being really strict with themselves about being 100% raw and stuff like that, don't let, don't let your mind uh, make you miserable. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so true. And I never thought Jury and Ryder and Freely would start eating cooked food. And uh, ever since they did, it's so weird how that changed a lot of things because they're only two people. But I think they're trustworthy because they just come across that well, you know they're healthy from looking at them. And yeah. when they said even we struggle with it and it's our whole, you know, life, right. then it did take away, seemingly took away guilt of everyone, you know, because people all started saying, I'm eating cooked food. It made me wonder if perhaps they were all eating a bit of cooked food anyway, but then, you know, trying to get back onto a healthy regime in their mind and, and they just weren't admitting it to themselves or whatever. But it's, it's great that everyone knows there's a more sustainable way of doing it and it certainly seems the most balanced way and I'm not going to have a problem sticking to it forever because you can you can socialize you can do so much that you can't if you're just eating fruit yeah and I love that I love everything you're saying and it doesn't mean that you can't be 100% raw if you want to you yeah, can be yeah. it's what, what I didn't like is that there appeared to be this kind of wall being built between raw vegans and cooked vegans that that's and to me you know we don't need any uh internal strife we this is a you know i'm kind of interested in getting the message out and and uh providing the broader public that's still on a traditional diet to kind of really consider these things so uh we don't need to be you know seeing oh you're 100 percent raw you're 50 percent raw or you know yeah yeah i think i I think the discussion is interesting uh because it gives us a chance to talk about I think we all feel that 100% raw makes you feel incredible, um, even people who, who don't eat it. But it's just too difficult. It's going to make you yo-yo all the time. And in terms of health, I've started thinking recently that this is a good way to try and transition to 100% raw if that's your goal. Because it's only after doing this for a while that you get into that habit of eating fruit all day and feel okay and don't feel deprived. And it is also a, a spiritual thing as well. I remember eating 100% raw for a few months at one point and actually feeling totally disconnected from people in London and feeling like throwing a slipper at the TV once when an advert for Multi Cheerios came on because it's like, <laughs> it's something good and something they enjoy. And I was like, no, it's not good for them. How dare you? you know? And like, you can't, <laughs> you can't really live like that, can you? You gotta be engaged with the zeitgeist and the people around you, especially if you wanna help anyone. You can't be an intellectual in a cave of ice saying, oh, I managed to, and, and I think, what has interested me about uh, Freely and Durian Ride is that they don't seem to be able to get amazing quality fruit in Australia, which I wouldn't have thought. <laughs> I know. And have you seen the prices, the prices that they yeah. pay for fruit? It's, it's yeah, staggering. It's realize, yeah, it really made me realize that in London you wouldn't think it, but I'm really spoiled for um, produce here. And if you want to get local, you can, uh, because there's a load of rich people in London. So, you know, there, there are places you can go to get locally grown. But I don't, I don't have that kind of money at the moment. Yeah. But if yeah. I did, I would probably invest it in that. I think that's the most important in investment. And organic well, as well. And two, I think another option might be for folks who have a, a winter like you do, you know, where it's 
it's not a tropical environment all year round. Maybe a maybe a raw till four from say October through March, and oh, then yeah. a fully raw through the summer or something like that. You know. That's really interesting because I have started feeling more like salads and things as it gets warmer. And um, a friend of mine, Tim Sheaf, who's a great. You should talk to him. He's he does parkour and all that. You know. And um, he yes, said, actually, he. I think. I think I've seen him somehow associated with you, but yeah, yeah go ahead, yeah. Um, he uh, was talking about how it might actually be a good idea to eat locally in terms of your living, I, and maybe this is not an original thought, but it's the first time I thought about it, that you're a part of the ecosystem then, because you get the same sun that that produce has got, and, you know, yeah. you're part of the set, just like when you eat honey, I mean, I don't eat honey anymore, but people used to say, eat honey and you help get rid of your hay fever because yeah. it's the same pollen and all that and I think the same could be true for produce and if you're in Britain then it's potatoes root vegetables apples things like that and that is more it fits better with raw till fall because you can eat potatoes and stuff all right um, let me let me ask you um you had this kind of five-year period where you were high fat raw and could you say a little bit about um any you, you you briefly characterized illnesses you had as a youth, which are yeah. pretty common, you know, lengthy colds and that may be sinus issues and some acne. Um, can you describe what happened to that when you did your vegetarianism and what happened to those things when you became high fat uh, vegan? Uh, vegetarian, nothing particularly happened at all. Right, <laughs> In right. fact, when I was vegetarian, because I was drinking milk, or rather eating milk in everything, it seems to be in everything, you know. Yeah. I got tonsillitis so many times that I had to have my tonsils out as a 20-year-old, which is, wow. they're quite, you know, they don't do that that often. And um, I should have, at that point, thought I'm obviously not well, but at no point does a doctor ever say this could be a sign that you're not eating a good diet. They don't think like that, do they? I know. So, I know. Um, but the... Yeah, the acne was always there. I, I actually did take Accutane as a teenager, which um, got rid of it, uh, and it never came back quite as badly. Um, and it just remained an annoying noise floor <laughs> of acne. And it was just really <laughs> distressing, isn't it? Like, I think some people handle it so well, because I don't notice it on other people. But I came from a background that was, you know, my family's fixated on looks and uh, you always feel like if you don't look perfect, then you're less of a person. Why would anyone love you? All that is really isolating if you look at it in the wrong way. Yeah, so I felt yeah, bad yeah. about myself all all along, really. And when I went on this three-day raw vegan thing, overnight it seemed to have quite a dramatic effect on my skin. And that was a strong, you know, my vanity <laughs> was a strong motivating <laughs> factor then. So, uh, so even even though it was relatively high fat content, that your acne went away. Um, I, yeah, I actually just experienced that to begin with because when I was eating the three day thing, I didn't include any nuts and seeds, and it hadn't occurred to me to do that. So then, when I started eating nuts and seeds because I was getting into this whole thing and making it a lifestyle. Uh, it got a lot worse. My acne got a lot worse. And I thought this is detox and stuff. And now knowing that nuts are a trigger for me and, and for loads of people, it's fat, I think, causes acne in a lot of people, although not in others. But uh, that, that's a shame that I didn't realize that because <laughs> there was like ages that that went on. But one interesting thing that I did notice was that even on a high fat vegan diet, I was losing weight gradually. Um, and I was never particularly overweight, but um, I think it would be good to be a bit, you know, I'm not even athletic now, and my weight is on a, sl a slow downward trend, which I think is good. And it was doing that when I was on a high fat uh, vegan diet. And I was eating about 3000 calories a day, not realizing because I didn't know how many calories were in nuts. And I, when I finally realized, I was like, how can I possibly not be putting on weight? And that's when I realized calories seem to get processed differently if they're natural to if they're not. Having said that, I think that fat in a lot of people's body gets, you know, has a, an effect on blood sugar and stuff. And right. they wouldn't experience the same thing with right. weight loss. I think a lot of people on the high fat vegan diet never quite lose weight. So it, it does seem like an individual thing, but I think because I'd starved myself of all kinds of nutrients, it was having a good effect. Uh -huh, I, that's, in, that's interesting. 
am I right in thinking that your primary sources of fat were nuts, seeds, and avocados, and and probably yeah. no no free oils, right? No, I never got into that stuff. I, <laughs> no, just um, yeah, and olives and nuts and seeds. And nowadays, I don't eat any. Um, I eat olives sometimes, but not really avocado that much, although I would occasionally. But nuts and seeds, I just stay away from because I think they're quite scarce in the wild. If, if you're going to eat them, you'd have to take the time to get into them, and that takes forever, and you wouldn't be eating them in massive quantities. So also because they trigger my acne, but I, I think I'll just stay away from them. <laughs> well, and I imagine you've probably looked into this. Can you give the, the viewers your take on essential fatty acids then? I noticed that when I type in an 80-10-10 diet into chronometer, it seems like you've got no fat in that at all, but the omega-3s are always at 100%. And for me, it's coming from, it seems to be coming from um, the, the dark leafy greens. And yeah. also, I think mangoes as well, I think, funnily enough, because there was a time when I had eye, eye straight, like dry eye, <laughs> you know, getting red eyes, and I read that omega-3s can help, and I upped my intake of uh, mangoes and greens, and then it did help, I, you know. Whereas That's anyone amazing. else would be saying you have to go for fish and or flax at the very least or something. And right. I always hear this bloody myth that, you know, we must have got our intelligence from eating fish because you can't get omega-3 anywhere else. And it's a misconception that comes from the fact people don't realize if you're going to get it from a vegan diet, you should be eating a huge amount of produce, like a, a big amount of greens, I think. I know other people don't eat that many greens, and maybe you get omega-3s in a lot of fruits as well, but it's because my diet's always included salads that I'm just noticing, even though it looks like there's no overt fats, you still well, get what you yeah, need. Yeah, I think you're, this is a huge point. You're reminding me of Swayze Foster. She, she was eating essentially no fat in her diet, but plenty of greens. She got her blood test and the EFAs were fine, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but what's hard for me, I'm trying to get my psychology around it, is this notion of one to two pounds of greens a day. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see, how do you all do it? I mean, I can eat like a, a half a pound pretty easily, but okay. I, I, I don't know, a, a pound, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. Well, I eat about a pound a day. I don't know if I would manage two pounds. And I noticed that since other people don't even eat that, I think it's kind of all right as long as you just include greens and uh, do your best. Yeah. But a pound I can eat by um, cu <laughs> cutting into pieces. <laughs> it's my secret. No, you just like, I, I do. <laughs> I do take a load of dark green leafy things and cut them into really small pieces and it, it seems to reduce the volume a lot. It makes it dense and it, if in effect it cooks, it seems like you've cooked it. So you know... Well, it's, it's, it's helping you with mastication too, that's great. Yes, yeah. yeah. I know it technically, you know, it oxidizes the stuff, it's not as good that way, but it's, no, I don't think it's a big deal. And the other way, of course, when I had the iron worry, uh, I was making green smoothies and I found you can put about 100 or 200 grams of spinach or something in a smoothie and uh, you don't really notice it if it's spinach. I wonder about oxalic acid with spinach because people say that may cause kidney stones. And yeah. keep thinking to myself, maybe I shouldn't eat so much, but I've never really cut it down and I haven't had any problems in 10 years. So sometimes I think that I wouldn't juice it, but I would eat, you know, just in case, but I would eat it whole because I get the feeling, the fiber and the way it's packaged probably makes it 100% fine. But yeah, that's interesting. Um, I guess kale, one of the reasons kale is so popular, I think it has a lot of the benefits that spinach has, and I, 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 it must have some oxalic acid, but I don't think it's as high. And I think there's also, there might be, I don't know if there's truth to this, but do the baby spinach leaves have less oxalic okay. acid? Than the, than the older ones, maybe? Maybe they do. I haven't looked into that. But I was I never liked kale that much because I think the taste of it, that it's hard to eat. And the way I saw it prepared often involved uh, lemon and salt. You know, you massage lemon and salt into it. I thought, you may as well cook it. I mean, <laughs> like, <laughs> trust it because 
these cruciferous... I think it's a member of the Brassica family. I think it is. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So, so these cruciferous things can affect your uh, thyroid function if you eat too many. And uh -huh. I don't think it's a problem for people. I don't think they're going to be eating enough to cause that. But just when you see something that definitely is linked to a problem, I'm not sure it's 100% natural. And I don't like the taste of broccoli raw, even though you can eat it. So kale, I don't particularly like either. So I've always gone thinking, gone by, would I like to eat this raw? And if I would, I just eat it. And, you know, even though people say that about spinach, I think, it tastes about right. This is probably about right, <laughs> you know. And then there's. I like else. that. I like. That. <laughs> well, I think that's that's what we would have been doing all along. <laughs> yeah. And then there's so many others like corn, corn salad, lamb's lettuce, and I notice with the um, the ones that have a kick like arugula or rocket, we call it in Britain. Uh, if you put that into a green smoothie. Ones that taste slightly strong but are pleasant, they seem to give you even more energy. So. Huh. And okay. if you heard this thing, I always bang on about this, but you heard this thing about um, a, a molecule of chlorophyll being almost identical to a molecule of human heme in the blood, uh, which seems to suggest that the chlorophyll helps you get oxygen into your blood. I love that. I love that. That's yeah, a beautiful a point, a powerful <laughs> point. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now, now the I irony with that, you know, uh, I think some meat eaters will argue, well, because because meat is so similar to human flesh, it's, it's, it's ideal for the body to use it. But um, there's a lot of things that doesn't take into account, uh, pro perhaps mainly that it, it's cooked to be eaten, which changes I... composition. Um, and also it's not suited for our digestion. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's the same with protein that you think that it would be better to get protein that's more like the protein you use. But the, we know the body unpicks protein from meat and breaks it down into its constituent amino acids and then does all the jobs in the body and it's the equivalent of you know you want to make a beautiful wedding dress so you get another wedding dress and you unpick it and you try and make your own whereas if you're eating the plant sources you get the natural materials and you can start with fresh new ones and I think it's possibly the same with uh, iron and, and heme or whatever <laughs> that's same a beautiful stuff. I love that analogy that's a great analogy um, so, okay, so you did the uh, raw, high-fat vegan approach for about five years. You had yep. some improvements in terms of weight. Uh, your acne might have gotten worse. Uh, yep. <laughs> and then was there like an aha moment, hey, I, I don't have to do the high-fat thing? Yeah, you know, the weird thing is, and I know that there's a, a bit of a schism now between Doug Graham and, you know, lo loads of schisms. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the weird thing is, I'd seen Doug's book a few times and heard of 801010 and totally understood it and thought that's not for me, it's too difficult. And I don't, they are just extreme. And it was only when I saw the early videos from uh, Harley and Freely and just thought these people are radiant and they're also happy. They're, there's something really beautiful about these people and they both look attractive. Like, you know, I think that's a good body type to have. Uh, for men and women where it's not bulked up and like a heart attack waiting to happen. I've never found that attractive, you know, but <laughs> it's, it looks more like a Japanese kind of body, you know, thin people who, and that's what they eat, isn't it? Like, you know, a high carb, often vegan style diet. So, the, so you're not into the Arnold Schwarzenegger look. <laughs> no, no, I never was. No, I, that, I, I, that gives I, people like me hope. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> no. I, I think that it, it looks a bit artificial sometimes, although sometimes people are just naturally that way. But when you see people really pumped up, to me, it suggests they're doing something slightly unnatural. And it also looks a little bit vain, like they're more like a woman than a woman because they're spending three hours in the gym, where, you know, as opposed to someone who spends three hours on their makeup. It sort of seems similar. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That's, that's a great <laughs> point. Great point. Yeah, well, I, it was seeing them and thinking uh, they're talking plainly as well. They're showing us the food they're buying. And I love these videos that Harley used to do of just getting a load of things on his bike and, and driving it home on his bike. Yeah. And it, it didn't seem to be, the video didn't seem to mean anything, but actually you need that demonstration to see how people do it. <laughs> yeah, really... he's, he's great at that, the practical yeah. thing. Listen, um, 
hang with me for one second, Carrie. Okay. I am gonna, I'm gonna hang up. This is gonna be part one. Okay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang up, and I'm gonna call you back because uh, it'll be much easier for me to edit. Um, but we have right. gone an hour. I, I could probably talk to you the rest of your night. Uh, but, so you have to tell me when to shut up. So you, no, when you have to go. You to talk, I could talk to you for the rest of the night as well. But you tell me when to shut up. <laughs> All right. All right. I will call you right back. Okay. All right. I'll see you in a minute. Okay.